I now look to Professor Katrina Pennell to continue the case for the proposition. Thank you, Mr. President, for your invitation to speak at this debate, and to the audience, thank you very much for coming to listen. As an academic historian, the centenary of the First World War is certainly of interest to me, but I'm not centrally invested in its pursuit. I have no column inches to sell, no cause to advocate, and no special responsibility to ensure the centenary is conducted in a particular manner. Along with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jenny MacLeod, I am an interested, reflective bystander, watching the centenary unfold, getting involved where relevant, all the while gathering evidence to help us interpret what this once-in-a-generation moment can tell us about issues relating to British culture, war remembrance and identity in 21st century Britain. In my allotted time, I'd like to use these research findings to support this motion. This House believes we have not remembered them. And I intend to do this through three main points. One, those who have engaged with the centenary of the First World War are not representative of wider British society. In its scale and investment, the centennial commemorations of the First World War can be considered the largest heritage project Britain has seen, with at least £150 million invested by the Government and Heritage Lottery Fund since 2010. But who has been doing this remembering? The evidence suggests that those engaging in commemorative practices do not represent a diverse cross-section of this entire country. As part of the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project Reflections on the Centenary of the First World War, just under 94% of respondents to our national survey of community engagement in centenary activity were white, above the national average of 81.9%. 63% were aged 51 or over, way above the national average of 37%. Over 26,000 volunteers have engaged in lottery-funded centenary projects since 2014, but as the Heritage Lottery Fund itself acknowledges, it has been a challenge for projects to engage non-white people. Even government-funded projects targeting young people, such as the First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours programme, are under-recruiting in terms of diversity. The fact that this initiative is only open to state-funded secondary schools in England also highlights the restrictive nature of, its of those participating. So my first point, the data indicates that centenary activity has predominantly been engaged with by a committed minority of white retirees with the time and resources to do so. My second point, centenary activity has been selective, focusing on traditional subjects and failing to widen understanding and awareness beyond the white male British soldier. The standout British events of the centenary, the Tower of London Poppies, Jeremy Deller's We're Here Because We're Here, Peter Jackson's They Shall Not Grow Old, have all focused on the British dead, British soldiers, battles etched in British memory, such as the Somme and the Western Front. Education initiatives like the Battlefield Tours programme have focused on the Western Front. In the classroom, the top three First World War history topics covered at Key Stage 3 in the national curriculum are trench warfare, causes of the war and the Western Front. There has been little consideration of alternative commemorative categories. Women, survivors, non-participants, refusers, children, the elderly, the injured or the enemy. Or alternative commemorative spaces, fronts beyond Western Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the war of movement, the war of the sea, the war in the air. Even the very framing of the centenary, 2014 to 2018, is Eurocentric and ignores the multitude of conflicts and suffering that continued long after the guns fell silent on the Western Front in November 1918. At best, the experience of non-white soldiers has been tacked on as a peripheral subject, rather than integrated into mainstream narratives. Take the curious example of the August 2014 National Commemorative Ceremonies, one in Westminster Abbey, conventional, traditional, marking the outbreak of the war, and the other in Glasgow Cathedral for Commonwealth troops. Why was there not a single event for all those who participated? David Olasoga's highly commended BBC Two series, The World's War, Forgotten Soldiers of Empire, shone an important light on lesser known stories of the war, but it totaled 120 minutes out of two and a half thousand hours of centenary programming scheduled by the BBC. 
The Imperial War Museum, First World War Galleries, open to much acclaim in 2014, have been criticised for the lack of prominence of stories in their exhibition spaces of those beyond the white world. The recently launched Remember Together campaign is necessary because, according to one of its key organisers, and I quote, most people, Muslims included, don't know that thousands of Muslim soldiers from present-day Pakistan fought for Britain, directly contradicting claims that the British public's understanding of the global nature of the war has been expanded. Where colonial participation has been integrated into centenary remembrance, the memory has been sanitised. The more uncomfortable, painful and difficult aspects of these memories have been excised for something more celebratory, focusing on the martial races and the empire coming together. Historical realities of racism, ill treatment and slave labour have been ignored. Indian soldiers recuperating in Brighton Pavilion were deemed so threatening to the innocence of white womanhood that they were not allowed out without a white escort. Chinese labourers faced terrible racism. The South African Labour Corps were kept in a wired compound. White privilege has operated at all levels of the centenary commemorations, from the predominance of white stories, the suppression of historical truths of colonial subjugation and exploitation, and the frequency of white faces on our TV screens, in our university history departments, even our Oxford Union debates. So point two. During the centenary, challenging, uncomfortable and diverse histories of the war have been drowned out by familiar and traditional histories of predominantly white British soldiering within a European framework. It makes a huge difference because not everyone was stuck in a trench. There were different experiences in terms of geographical space, but also in terms of racial hierarchy, it makes a huge difference. <laughs> My third point, the original purpose of remembrance emerging from the human catastrophe of the First World War has been lost. On the 11th of November 1919, the first Armistice, Armistice Day, the Manchester Guardian announced, quote, today is peace day as well as church services gathering at the cenotaph and people standing silently in a public place, it was also a day for looking forward. Throughout the country, thousands attended meetings in support of the League of Nations, the first international forum for resolving disputes through peaceful rather than military means. Yet since then, there have been only short periods of time where the world has been free of war. The total number of deaths caused by conflict since 1918 are estimated at over 150 million people. As dignitaries gather in a few days' time in the solemnity of Westminster Abbey to remember the 1918 armistice, it will be in the knowledge of at least 400,000 dead in the Syrian civil war and 14 million people facing starvation in Yemen, the latter in part the result of the Conservative Party's accelerated arms sales to repressive regimes like Saudi Arabia since 2015. In this context, rhetoric of, quote, turning our backs on war and hatred, quote, learning from the past, quote, striving for a better future, and these are all direct quotations from British politicians over the past year, four years, ring hollow. In 2009, political leaders and media commentators competed to proclaim their respect for Harry Patch, the last veteran of First World War who died aged 111 yet ignored his core message, a fundamental rejection of war as nothing better than legalised mass murder. Without serious reflection on the causes of conflict, any desire to remember is vacuous. For Harry Patch, the 11th of November became nothing more than just show business. For many, the primary purpose of remembrance is the act of honouring the sacrifice and services of British military personnel, in the process raising funds to support their medical and social needs. The necessity of this form of social safety net, provided by the generosity of the general public rather than by the state, further hollows the rhetoric of we will remember them. It was a criticism levied at the government by ex-servicemen in 1921, who tired of perpetual homage to, the dead, to dead, the dead veteran when surviving ones were living in poverty, disrupted commemorations at the Cenotaph. A century later, the government's controversial new benefits scheme, Universal Credit, has been criticised by representatives of prominent veterans' charities for making life harder for ex-service personnel in need of state support. So to close, by ignoring the two fundamental pillars of remembrance, striving for ways to resolve conflict through peaceful means and looking after our armed service personnel, we are not, in my view, honouring the memory of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice in the name of this country. Thank you.